Okay, we're going to make a start then. Um, so welcome this afternoon uh, to this parallel session, half an hour. Uh, so in the next half an hour, you'll be um, uh, listening to um, Abigail ba Bale um, here from Warwick, um, the head of um, Technology Enhanced Learning. And the session is Transforming and Enhancing Teacher Education. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Abigail and um, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, lovely. Yeah. As long as, yeah, I think we're going to, we're stuck with that. There's not much I can do. Um, so yes, my name's Abby Ball. I'm Assistant Professor and Head of Technology Enhanced Learning in the Centre for Teacher Education here at the University of Warwick. And first of all, I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about my role. So I plan and deliver CPD activities in Technology Enhanced Learning. I lead projects that embed innovative uh, TEL approaches into programmes, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, I meant staff in the use of appropriate technologies to develop their teaching practice and research, and I develop and facilitate TEL-focused um, curriculum enhancement opportunities, and I also undertake research and disseminate information about new and innovative use of existing technologies. I'm just going to now talk a little bit about the centre. Um, it's the Centre for Teacher Education, and we deliver postgraduate talk programmes to graduates who are looking to gain qualified teacher status. So our PGC programmes equip our students to teach in the early years, primary and secondary phases, and our students are based locally, nationally and internationally as well. We also run an MA in professional education programme, which is available internationally, and we've also got optional um, introduction to teaching modules for our undergraduates at Warwick to study certain um, topics such as maths and English. So the project itself is called the Digital Teacher Education Project. Um, Warwick has uh, goes through a strategy renewal process, which I'm sure other institutions do as well. And the project is part of, a, the, of the five year strategy renewal process for our department. And I'm gonna be talking about year one of the project today, which is um, took place last year. And it's the funded component of the project, which we predominantly use for staff buyout. So I'm just gonna move on. So this, charming diagram, which is a bit of an epic, but this is the diagram that we use to explain the project. So um, each of the, if I go just go through the diagram briefly, we've, we've got four strands, as we call them, which are topics, if you like, or themes, mentoring, digital communities of practice, reusable learning objects, and student experience and quality assurance. And embedded within each of those strands, we've got things like well-being, um, inclusion and inclusive teaching and also values and ethics and if you look at the horizontal lines on the diagram the idea is is that each of these strands feeds into our local PGCE to enrich the program um, our development and expansion of our international program and also the enrichment and then also our remote CPD provision each of the strands has got a lead so there's four leads um, and then a small team of staff that are working on that particular strand. Um, I'm the project facilitator, so I've got overview of the whole project, and I'm also a member of project board, and I've got a number of other roles, which um, is what I'm going to be talking about today. So what I'm going to do now is just move through each of the four strands and just tell you a little bit about what, they, what the purpose was, what they did, and then my reflections on the process of being involved with that particular group of people. So the first strand, the mentoring strand, they were looking at how we could provide video technology for our students um, so that they could record their lesson observations, essentially, and then share that with their tutors and with their mentors and then gain feedback from them. And this was all part of the um, instructional coaching process that we use at Warwick, and it's part of the work of Jim Knight if anyone wants to look up the information. So we're looking also to encourage the mentors to use instructional coaching principles during the mentor sessions. And in order to do that, we needed to provide them with CPD opportunities. So one of the pieces of work that we did on the project was to pilot um, a piece of work, a piece of software called Go React. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of Go React, but it's basically a tool that's used for um, teaching performance-based skills. 
So it's interactive cloud-based platform and you can submit videos and then you can grade the videos. Um, and one of the benefits with it is you can um, timestamp comments through the video, which is really quite useful. So the outcomes of the project, um, it was a successful pilot. We used GoReact, it was great. Um, and I'm not, there is nothing wrong with GoReact. I'm gonna say this and I'm not being funded by them. So I'm just saying this. But basically what we've decided due to a number of factors, we're not gonna be using, um, we're not currently using GoReact at the moment. We're, what we're using instead is Moodle as a Dropbox to allow our students to submit videos and then staff can assign comments at that point. It's not as good, obviously, as Go React. Um, you don't get the granular feedback, but we had a number of challenges, particularly on our international programs, with um, storing the recordings, whether they were going to be based on um, our servers or somewhere else. And um, because of that, it's easier just for us to use um, Moodle instead. Um, we also had significant challenges with recording children for safeguarding issues, and particularly in an international context, each country has its own rules about what you can record and what you can't record. The reason we wanted to do it was because you get benefit if you have a student teacher at the front of the class and they are um, recorded and they see what they're doing, but it's much more beneficial if you can also record the class and how they're actually interacting with it. That was a step too far. We were just not able to do that. And there's still a load of work going on to try and resolve these issues. But they're sort of part of the reasons why we ended up not using Go React. The second sort of tranche of this section, we did a load of curriculum planning. So what we've done is we've now got a growing collection of resources to help us to, or help our students to use video capture. We've also got a huge amount of mental resourcing being uh, mental resources being developed and they've already been developed and we're sharing them with our mentors and we've got what are called professional practice units so these are on placement experiences that are designed to integrate provider led so what we do here in university with what goes on out in placement on their student teaching experiences and quite a lot of those when they were developed they were very text-based and what we've able, been able to do is with the work with video we've actually been able to bring in different types of resources to add to these professional practice units um, to um, give the students um, alternative resources to use which has been really nice to do. So some of the reflections on this, um, I describe my role on this one as that of a critical friend. And you'll notice there's a hat on the screen. This is because I'm gonna be wearing lots of hats because I've got different roles as I work my way through the strands. Um, so a critical friend is someone who provides a supportive but neutral sounding board, if you like, but he's also there to challenge and ask questions that um, to the group in question. So what I was finding though, was that I was, the questions that I was asking the strand were being fed to me by project board. Everyone knew I was on project board. It wasn't like it was a secret or anything, but I was finding that the questions weren't my questions, if you like, they were someone else's questions. And I needed to find a way to reconcile those two um, roles, if you like. But what I became aware of was that the project board were asking questions about sort of admin and how we were going to integrate video with into our academic process. So they were legitimate questions and they were sort of the wider departmental questions from outside of the project. So I kind of thought, OK, well, if they're prepared to ask those kind of questions and they're acceptable, then what I need to do is think about what other questions can I ask? And I decided then to look at the types of questions that mentors might be asking because they were underrepresented. or We were inflicting, if you like, the software on them and getting them to do all this stuff, but we weren't actually giving them a choice in this process. So that's how I sort of reconciled the, the, the two sort of components of this and um, accepted my multifaceted role. Um, so I'm still asking challenging questions. We are still going forward with those um, and it's working well at the moment. So I'm gonna move on to the second strand and we kind of went pilot mad. So <laughs> we've got pilots everywhere. So we, this is the digital communities practice and we wanted to establish best practice guidance to facilitate the exchange of ideas and expertise amongst all our stakeholders, wherever they were based. And we also wanted to be able to let them learn from one another and stay up to date with their latest developments in their field. And because we're expanding out to a significantly large international audience, that's becoming increasingly difficult to do. So we decided to pilot a piece of software called GatherTown. 
and I don't, again, I'll explain what it is. It's, um, it's like web conferencing software where you can see yourself as a little avatar in the room and you can interact with others in the room. Um, so it kind of looks a bit like a sort of um, 80s video game, but it's quite, it's quite nice to do. It's quite useful. Um, and we piloted that across all of our programs. So not just um, our international program, which I will mention several times in a minute. Um, I've put on the screen that this was an unsuccessful pilot. Technically it was, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't anything to do with the software. It was just a number of factors that we had. And the biggest challenge that we had was actually getting student engagement. Um, and that was a surprise to me and the team. Um, our students were, we've got students based all over the world, some in countries such as China and Saudi Arabia. And our choice of the topic, which was Rainbow Allies topic, which was um, about equality, diversion and inclusion, um, that was a challenge to get those students in those countries to be able to interact with that. So that was a, that was an issue for us. Um, we also piloted partway through the year, um, basically because that was when the funding was available. And that also was a real problem because the students had gone past the point where they wanted to take on new technologies. Um, and um, so what we've been doing instead, we're looking at widening the choice of subjects for our communities of practice, things like students with caring responsibilities, students with dyslexia. And then what we've also done is we've introduced Gather Town during the induction program so that the students can try it out. They can meet the teachers that are involved in it. They can meet the students that are going to be using it. Um, and if you like, they can build trust before they actually get to the point where they've got to use it. And we're actually going to say to them, right, now you need to go and use it. Um, and um, we're also using um, Gather Town on our online conference days, um, as that's a sort of, everyone's online. So it's a sort of contained environment, if you like. So um, my role in this particular um, project was that of co-lead. Um, that in itself was an experience. Um, Fortunately, I was able to persuade my co-lead that we were being over-reliant on one particular community topic. And um, I used the academic literature to bolster my argument, if you like, to justify why we needed to do it. So I suppose it's one of the benefits of working in academia is that you can actually do that and people do take, advantage, do take notice of you when you do. Um, as I said, we've introduced this software during induction because of the opportunities to build trust. Because as, as Booth says here, one of the known issues with communities of practice is, you know, is that establishing of trust and sharing. Um, so we're trying everything that we can to actually give the students much more opportunities for this so that they will actually be much more comfortable with the software. Um, from a personal perspective, I guess I suppose I've come, become quite good at writing funding bids, Warwick funding bids. I've gained, managed to gain three different sources of funding to help us with this project. So that's been a, a personal thing for me. And I think my persuasion skills have improved, um, but there's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done with them. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the fourth, um, sorry, the third um, strand. This is the reusable learning object strand or ROLOs as everyone in the department calls them. Um, and the idea is, is that we wanted to create a collection of reusable learning objects that we could, that we were gonna build around the Warwick teacher values of social justice, intellectual curiosity, can't say it, and creativity. And, and again, for those of you that don't know, know, ROLOs are instructional design components that can be used in multiple for multiple settings. They're normally small electronic components and they developed for a specific use, but you can reuse them in lots of different settings. So the, the purpose of this strand was to basically develop lots of reusable learning objects. I was lead on this strand, not out of choice, but because we had a member of staff who was in post left and we didn't have enough time to recruit someone else. So I ended up having to take this one on. So you can start to see how my role, I have so, so many different roles um, going forward. So I developed and led a load of CPD activities for our staff within the department. Um, I made the decision that these were going to be cross phase. So staff have got a tendency to work in silos. So I actually deliberately mixed up the groups so that we had early years working with secondary and things like that. Um, and we focused on making reusable learning objects for the professional practice units that I've previously mentioned. I've also developed evidence-based guidance 
for all our stakeholders to be able to use for developing and using reusable learning objects. And I've attended a number of dissemination events, such as uh, the University's Council for the Education of Teachers, Cultivate, which is a, um, a community that's based at Warwick, that's looking at supporting learning, teaching and assessment. And then also I presented at uh, Teal Fest, which again, it's a Warwick event um, for sharing technology enhanced active learning practice, research and ideas and experiences. So I would say that in setting up the, the training, the CPD, the way I did, staff within the department had a much better idea of the wider picture and what we were doing and why we were doing it and how we could reuse these resources across different phases and I think the work that I did also set up um, other CPD opportunities for the department because staff were then able to take advantage of say for example training on H5P or quizzes or whatever they were doing. I have to say from a personal perspective far easier when you're the lead when you're not having to co-lead or negotiate or try and persuade someone from behind the scenes in a role as a critical friend when you're in charge you say what you want to do and you get on with it it's much much easier um we also had the advantage with this particular strand that there was much more um of a focus need we were piloting yes another pilot um an international PGC program and we needed resources to be able to use on that program so we had a looming deadline and we needed to get things done by then so that really did help to focus us um, I think one of the presentations that I was in this morning talked about the importance of exemplars and I would say that's key if you're going to explaining to staff what they what you know what a reusable learning object is they need to see examples but one of the things I would say it's kind of a balancing act what I found was if you gave a member of staff an example, let's say an interactive quiz that you'd created in H5P, they would then go away and think, oh yeah, great, I'll go and do that. And then they create another interactive quiz in H5P. So you needed to have different types of examples for the same topic in order that they could see that there was a range of stuff. And then you would get the, the broader choice um, that they would make different things. Um, I'm also mentioned the fact the way I set up the CPD sessions and the fact that staff were then able to take advantage of further training and in doing that that actually gave me the freedom to be able to focus on planning and development rather than having to train people how to use H5P so that was that was quite a good thing for me. So moving on to the final strands the student experience and quality assurance strands so we wanted to provide um, recommendations for a solution for data management, assessment, portfolio submissions, um, work-based learning communications for students, mentors, staff, for the whole length of the initial teacher education journey, um, irrespective of where they were located. And to do that, we piloted a piece of software called Mosaic, which is, um, it's basically, it's a bespoke piece of software for students who are on initial teacher education. So it's been designed for you to be able to assess them through the whole length of their journey. Um, and we piloted it on our international education program. It was a very successful pilot, had, had really good feedback from staff and students involved. Um, we found it was much easier to manage um, our external users, so our mentors on, the pro, on this particular piece of software. Um, one of the challenges that we have at Warwick is, is that getting external users don't have Warwick accounts, so therefore we can't give them access to the system. So we, we found a way to get around this, if you like. Um, we are currently using Mosaic on our international PGC program again this year. Um, but as any of you who work in higher education know, once if you want to roll something out, you then go past the point where you need to go to tender. And that's what we're having to do next. Obviously, we're inviting Mosaic to bid for tender, but it's going to be an open bid, an open tender. And everyone who's interested can, 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 can bid, for the, uh, bid for the work. So some reflections from this one. Um, there's a reason I've used a hard hat as my hat on this one. This was quite hard, it really was. I'd expected I was gonna be a critical friend. I thought I would have the same role as I did with the mentoring strand, and that was just not the case. There was far too many things that were needed to be much more hands-on, needed to be involved. Um, 
one of the things, well, obviously, when you're looking to pilot a piece of software, you have to involve your IT department and you have to justify to your IT department why you want to pilot the software. You also have to um, get legal team involved so that we can come up with a contract for the pilot. These are all things that I never thought I would have to get involved with as an, in an academic technology type role, but I did. So hence, I've got far more skills probably than I want to know about how to negotiate, how to deal with conflict re resolution. I've learned far more about legal speak than I ever want to have to learn ever again. Um, apologies to anybody who's got a legal background in here. Um, but one of the things that I did gain was a lot of experience with having to communicate with people who didn't really know what I was talking about, basically. So, you're, you know, we're in our little bubbles, we work in our departments, and you've got like shorthand when you speak to your colleagues, they know what you're talking about, but you shift to an external department or a different department, and you have to start to explain much more clearly why you're doing something and what you're doing. So my, as I said, my negotiation skills, my wider communication skills have definitely improved. Um, working within the department and on the pilot, I found that I've learned a lot more about how the different phases, so the early years, primary and secondary phases are assessed. You'd think we're all delivering the same program. The students all get a PGCE qualification at the end of it, but the actual nitty gritty assessment points are quite different. Um, and I've also learned a lot about um, the assessment and feedback process that exists out in schools, because I don't have any, I'm not involved in that normally at all. So I learned a lot more about mentoring, what the mentors have to do, the workload that's involved with them. And I would also say that it's improved my active listening skills and my assertiveness skills as well, because at times that's be really quite stroppy to say why I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But anyway, um, okay, so just to summarize then really, um, Basically, for leadership, this was a really complex project, and um, I'd say you need to look at each leadership, leadership situation differently, then no two situations are going to be the same. Um, take each one as an opportunity, even if at the time, sometimes it really doesn't feel like an opportunity, but you just need to take it. Um, there's a quote that I've found from, allegedly from Thomas Edison, I'm not entirely sure of how valid it is but he says basically I didn't fail a thousand times the light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps and that's how it kind of felt on this project it was we did have failures but we've had to learn to move forward go around them try an alternative way and and it's so it, it is constantly lots of little steps in order to move forward um what I would say with complex projects like this, it's not just about leadership. Yes, leadership is important, but it's also about innovation. And it's about allowing the staff that are involved on the strands in this case to innovate, for them to have the space to be able to make the decisions, to be able to, to make mistakes. You know, we got things wrong. You know, there's no recriminations. It was just all part of the learning experience. And it's about making it a positive, as positive an experience as you can within that process. It's also about change management. Um, you've got to, it's very easy to focus on what you're doing in the project and forget that there are lots of people who are just carrying on doing their day-to-day -day stuff and they're not involved and they're not gonna know what you're talking about. So you need to be able to bring them along with, with you, if you like. And that part of that is about managing change. And I would say it's um, enjoyable, <laughs> but challenging is how I would describe um, the work that I've done. So um, reward and recognition was something that um, Alt wanted me to talk about. That's actually quite hard. Um, because we're only in year one, or we've just completed year one, we're in year two of the project, and it's a five-year project, I think the reward is still coming. I Yes, I've had personal um, rewards, if you like. I've been able to, my skills have developed. I've been able to present at events and things like that. Um, but I think the bigger rewards will come towards the end of the project when we finish what we're doing. From a recognition perspective, absolutely. Um, there's been, because I've been working across the whole department, because I've been working with external Warwick departments, I would say that my rec the recognition that I have received has been, that's huge. I mean, I've, I, know, I now know people from all over the place, all different departments, and that's great. And that's one of the really good experiences on working on these bigger complex projects is that you do end up having to engage with lots of other people and lots of other departments. Um, I think, okay, we've got five minutes, wow. I've got two screens of references, that's all that is to finish. It, when I've practiced this, it's taken me like 
40 minutes, 45 minutes. So I'm surprised I've got here with five minutes to spare. So is it open for questions? Is that all right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Or is that the tumbleweed moment, as I call it? Yeah, if you do. Please, please. I've asked loads of questions. Okay. Fine, come over to. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, um, uh, it often takes uh, shorter because when people are sort of presenting in, in person and the rehearsal is often longer, but yeah, you talk much faster uh, live um, as I'm doing now. Uh, yeah, Chris. Um, yeah, um, so really interested in this. Obviously, you're surfacing a lot of the complexity of, of this sort of project. Um, and I just kind of wonder what, how visible is all this to the students? Because obviously it's really valuable experience for them to kind of understand what it's yeah. like to go through these sorts of projects because they're going to be doing them too. Yeah. I just kind of wonder what their involvement was. Um, one of the challenges that we've got in the department is that our PGC programme is a year long. So it's very, very difficult. It's not like you could start something in the first year of an undergraduate degree and then you've still got the students at the end three years later. We've got just over a year, boom, that's it, then they're gone. So it's really difficult to get student involved. Um, we did get a lot of feedback from students, particularly on the pilot software. So they, they, they have been involved in the pilot. Um, and we've taken on board a lot of their, um, their, their suggestions and things moving forward. But it's like we've started, because we've started again this year, we've kind of lost all that feedback. It's something that I do want to... Um, I would like to take the project more visibly to things like student staff liaison committees and things like that. That's going to be a little bit more of a logistic challenge, but yeah, um, it's work in progress, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, another question at the back. Hi, very interesting. I was just wondering if you could repeat like the main goal of the project and how you feel like where you are now, because you're saying it's five years, do so you feel, yeah, where are you in the process and what are the next steps? Okay, it's a really good question. Um, we basically, it's about, it's called the Digital Teacher Education Project, and it's about transforming teacher education. That's the overall goal. Um, I would say we are probably quite a bit further on than possibly this presentation um, suggests. Um, well, alongside this, which I haven't, I didn't mention as part of the presentation, was we're, we're undergoing a massive curriculum review process, and we've got a whole load of new courses, or well, all of our courses have got to be, re, have been revalidated, and we start afresh with a new curriculum next year. So all of this is running in parallel to that. So I would say by the time we hit, what would that be, two and a half, three years, we're going to be well on the way um, to, and I would say also that our curriculum is very very different now to what it was when we started this and it's going to be even more different by the time we get to that point so yeah we're getting there <laughs> any oh go on yeah um do you feel like the two changes are like going hand in hand or do you actually feel like the curriculum review and this project are kind of uh was it like colliding like uh, um working against each other they're again good question they're they're not working against each other basically because i'm involved in both <laughs> um but but from my perspective it does mean there's a lot of work i've got to reconcile what's going on in here with what's going on in the curriculum development and it's again it's about bringing pe the disparate groups together to work on things so it will be sorted it will be fine but yeah at the at times i do feel like it's like i want to smack people's head together and just sort of say get on with it but i can't so <laughs> yeah Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. It's probably too soon to give a, a definitive answer to this, but do you anticipate a kind of knock on effect where your trainees are taking this kind of uh, technology out into schools? Because it seems to me the zeitgeist in schools at the moment is to be um, really, really conservative with their technology use. Yeah. Yeah. That's ideally, that's what we would like to do. Yes, very much so. Um, one of the things that we noticed when we were in um, COVID in the lockdown, because we were teaching our students online, we were finding that they were taking those skills 
from those lessons that that they were learning and they were actually having to so they, they were almost finding that they were switching role they were they were becoming the the knowledgeable ones rather than their their teachers or their mentors out in schools so that's kind of flipped back now that we've gone back to more traditional teaching but i think yes i think it will it will start to happen um because they do vote with their feet you know they they like certain technologies and that's what they'll go with so yeah and they will bring them out into their teaching yeah very much so okay thank you yeah that's a really good question a lot of uh snapback um peter bryant's uh, blog um on snapback snapback um do have a look at that uh any more questions for abigail um if not um thank you very much round of applause for abigail okay thank you very much for your time thank you